Hi, everybody. Welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Bobby Osuri. I'm the health educator and co-editor for MS Focus, and I'm joined today by Dr. Thrower in this webinar where everybody can ask all their MS-related questions. Now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ben Thrower, Medical Director of the Shepherd MS Institute and Senior Medical Advisor to MS Foundation. Dr. Thrower, thank you so much for joining us today. And we're going to start the webinar unless you have something else you'd like to add. No, just thank you to, to you and to everyone else at MS uh, Focus. You folks are wonderful. And uh, I think I've said this before, the Q&As are one of my favorite things to do. Yes, like, I have to yeah, mute. You just never know what kind of uh, questions or thoughts uh, people have. So yeah, let's let's get started. All right. So before we get started with the questions, I just want to make everybody aware. There's a few ways to ask your questions. You can either raise your hand and I will call on you in which you can speak your question and ask Dr. Thrower directly. You can also use the Q&A option at the bottom. This allows you to ask your question anonymously if you'd like to do so, or you can ask your question in the chat. And for those watching on Facebook, please feel free to ask your questions in the Facebook chat, and I will direct it over to this webinar. So first question from Sharon, have you ever heard of naltrexone used for MS pain? So naltrexone has an interesting history. So just if anyone's not heard of it, it's, it's an oral agent. It is an opioid receptor antagonist. It's, it was originally designed to help get people off of uh, prescription painkillers or heroin. It's sometimes used to for alcohol uh, abuse and get people off of alcohol. Uh, the, the typical FDA approved pill is a 50 milligram. So what's used in MS is called low dose naltrexone. It's usually somewhere between three and 4.5 milligrams. That's why it gets the low dose uh, name. It's a compounded drug. It's made in mom and pop pharmacies. There is, there was a lot of hype about it years ago about what it might do in MS. And I would say the reality probably didn't match the hype. Um, there have been a couple of studies that have looked at it in uh, uh, secondary progressive MS. And it did seem to, to make people feel better. There were quality of life surveys that were done. And there was a trend towards maybe people having less pain, having better energy levels. It was subtle. It's not a cure by any stretch. It's one of those things that um, I don't think it's a substitution for a disease modifying therapy. I'm If someone's really interested in it, we're certainly willing to prescribe it. I think it's a fairly benign uh, thing to do with a, a you know, low risk. It's easy. It's one pill per day. Insurance frequently won't cover it because it, it, we're using it off label. It's not crazy expensive. Okay, thank you. Uh, Barbara asks, how can you treat insomnia caused by MS lesions? So insomnia, you know, if you back up and just look at sleep disruption in general, sleep disturbances are very, very common in the MS uh, community. And there are a lot of things that can disrupt sleep. Maybe it's a symptom from your MS. Maybe you're having to empty your bladder frequently. Maybe you're having spasms in the legs at night. So there are symptoms that can disrupt sleep. There are sometimes medications might disrupt sleep. Uh, if someone has issues with, say, depression, depression is notorious for fragmenting our sleep. Uh, so we do a little bit of detective work to try to get a sense of why a person's not sleeping well. Uh, sleep apnea is not uncommon in the MS community. If we have a suspicion of that, we might refer the person for a sleep study to get a better sense. So there are tons of treatments for, for sleep uh, issues in MS. The treatment is really going to depend upon which of those paths uh, the, the person's going down. Sometimes there's more than one thing going on, but there, there certainly is, yeah, there is treatment available. Thank you. Marla asks, I heard that Delta-8 isn't good for you. What is the difference between Delta-8 and Delta-9 in your opinion? Yeah, so the whole THC world, you know, and THC is a cannabinoid. It's one of the phytocannabinoids that we find in the in the cannabis plant. The whole THC world has gotten really weird in the past few years. So the the real THC that is in the cannabis plant is delta nine THC. You can find delta eight, delta nine, and delta ten THC products everywhere now, and they are technically legal so you've got the the real 
Delta 9 THC that is regulated via different states have different laws, you can go on Facebook and look up Delta 8, Delta 9, Delta 10 THC and find it legally. How are they doing that? It's because it starts life as a CBD, a hemp-based product. Hemp is technically legal. Um, CBD is legal in all 50 states. So if, if a hemp grower takes CBD from hemp and chemically converts it into Delta-8, Delta-9, or Delta-10 THC, technically that's legal. Um, so no, one clue that it might be one of those chemically derived products, if, if the product says uh, this THC is hemp derived, that means it started life as a CBD product. If the manufacturers were doing it the right way, it, it, the Delta 8, Delta 9, and Delta 10 hemp products are probably okay. The question is, are they doing it the right way? That chemical conversion is usually done either with toluene, formaldehyde, hydrochloric acid. There's something, something that's used to convert that CBD. And the question is, is that manufacturer getting all of that bad stuff out before they put it on the product for you as a Delta 8 product? If you could find some sort of, of what we call a COA, a certificate of analysis, showing that that product has been independently verified to have what they say is in it and nothing that, that shouldn't be in there, it, in theory, it probably is okay. I would just say, be cautious, buyer beware, You know, realize that these are, that this is a really rapidly changing uh, industry and it's the, it, like I say, it is the wild, wild west out there right now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Deborah asked, does Ocrevus contribute to insomnia? And do you recommend getting a regular blood test for JC virus titers? So Ocrevus itself really should not cause insomnia. You know, the, the side effects that we worry more about with Ocrevus are the immediate inject or infusion reactions and then monitoring labs over the long haul to make sure we're not uh, suppressing the immune system. Um, so I wouldn't think Ocrevus would be a high risk. Um, now, you do get some steroids when you get the Ocrevus infusion. That's part of your pre-medication regimen that that certainly does rev some people up and could interfere with your sleep for for a couple of days um so jc virus is something that we monitor when we're looking at pml risk i personally don't monitor jc virus in our our b cell therapy patients like ocrevus um, have there been cases of pml with ocrevus yes they're exceedingly rare almost all of them are what we call carryover cases. Someone was on another drug where there is risk of PML, like a natalizumab or Tysabri, or maybe an S1P uh, therapy like a Gelenia, and they were transitioning over to Ocrevus. During that transition period, sometimes these PML cases have popped up. It's really not the Ocrevus. It was the other drug that did it, but we have to kind of uh, label both drugs by, by FDA guidelines. Um, to my knowledge, there has only been one true de novo unprovoked case of PML with Ocrevus, and that was in an elderly gentleman who actually had a low white blood cell count before he ever went on Ocrevus. So you could argue he, he may have been immunocompromised before he went on Ocrevus. So it's a long answer uh, to the question. I, I don't uh, check JC virus antibody status uh, in our, our uh, Ocrevus patients. Thank you. Uh, anonymous question. Can you discuss the clinical trial with Mavenclad that showed no need for a new DMT for 15 years? Is this likely or just very rare? No. So Mavenclad or clat, the generic is cladribine is a really interesting drug. So it basically the way it works, it is in, it's knocking down populations of both B and T cells in your immune system. And when they come back, they seem to be reprogrammed to be less angry. And that less angry state seems to last for a very, very long time. So the majority of people after their two courses of Mavenclad, you know, you've got a, a course now, a year later, you get another course. Um, it seems to have a long-lasting effect for 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 most people. So that that 15-year data is you know is is interesting. I would say just in in MS research in general, we always have to be a little cautious when we start looking at 
you know, really long-term data, 10 year, 15 year, 20 year, because just by the nature of the way research is done, some people that were in that initial study start dropping out. So you have people that don't show up for you know, a research visit. So you've lost their data. And sometimes there is a suspicion that with some long-term data, there could be selection bias, that you're the only people that are staying in the study are the people who are doing really, really well. It's, it's not a criticism of Maven Cloud. That's just a, something we need to watch with all all studies that, you know, to make sure that we're you know, that we're not just getting the cream of the crop in those long-term uh, data. Right. Uh, Angie asked from Facebook, what is the best medication for pain? That is a, that's a tough one. The, the good news is there are a lot of medications for pain and the best medication for your pain is the medication that works for you individually. So, you know, in general with pain and MS, most of your options are either going to be anticonvulsants that have been repurposed for pain management. Gabapentin would be the, the most common one there, or they're antidepressants that have been repurposed for pain management, things like duloxetine or Cymbalta. And, you know, it's, it, there is some trial and error that's involved with that. You know, what, what's a great medicine in one person could have unacceptable side effects in somebody else. I would put the cannabinoids into that pain management sort of mix. So, you know, medical cannabis can play a role for certain types of pain. Um, depending upon what the person is dealing with, maybe it's more spasticity, uh, spasm-related pain. In that case, the antispasmodics like your baclofen and tizanidines may, may play, a, play a role. Thank you. Uh, Jim has raised his hand, so I'm going to allow him to talk. Jim, can you hear us? Yeah, I got you. I just unmuted. Hey, Doc. Appreciate hey, you. How are you? Me. I'm good. Hope Karen liked your duck. Yes, she did. <laughs> good deal. All right. Uh, two points. Um, one of them would, uh, when you get a chance, uh, talk a little bit more about uh, smoldering MS. But the other thing um, that specific question to ask you, and I put something in the chat uh, too, but um, I've noticed that I'm having an issue with uh, my sensories, uh, tactile versus visual. It's a uh, prime example is if I'm tying my shoes, when I'm watching myself tie my shoes, the coordination is bad. If I look away and just use one of the senses, I have better coordination, better response time. Like if I'm walking, if I look down and watch my feet when I'm walking, uh, especially barefooted, it, I have a tendency more to stumble versus the feedbacks, uh, feedback response on that. Is that something that's treatable? Is that something that you've seen in the past? So it has to do with, with proprioception and kind of your visual spatial sense. And it may be a little different for, for everybody. So, you know, a lot of times in MS, we can't feel position changes or how hard we're squeezing something. For some people, that means they actually do better if they're looking at it. So for instance, if I'm holding a coffee cup, and I can't feel how much, how hard I'm squeezing it, I'm probably going to do better holding on to it if I'm looking at it. Whereas if I look away, I'm I'm not monitoring and I can't feel that I'm squeezing it or not squeezing, so I might drop it. But it does vary from person to person. The walking one is that what you're describing is, is pretty common. When a lot of people can't feel position changes, if they're looking down at their feet, they're not looking at the visual horizon. And what a lot of people with MS are doing if they don't have good position sense is they're actually monitoring the visual horizon to see if they're tilting or not. So if they look down or they look at the person next to them and try to walk, then they've lost that visual horizon and their balance is, is suddenly off. Well, I get um, into what I feel like how I describe sensory overload. It's like too many things coming at me at once to try and process it all at the same time. <laughs> And I think that that happens as well, whereas if people are in like a busy environment, like they're in a store or a mall, and there's just too much going on. It's a noise and people talking, a lot of visual distractions. It, it does throw people off. On the smoldering um, MS, that's kind of one of the big hot topics in the MS world right now. Um, the smoldering MS, the, the idea is that it's not a big forest fire in your brain and spinal cord, that the big forest fire has maybe been put out by your disease modifying therapy, but there's just this low level kind of yeah, in, yeah, stuff going on. The the one of the terms that probably describes you know, this this idea of smoldering is is PIRA, P-I-R-A, progression independent of relapse activity. 
So this is the person who has no new lesions on MRI. They have no relapses, but they're still getting a little bit worse. And there are two things we think that may drive that, that worsening when there's no relapse and no new MRI activity. One would be this idea of this low-level inflammation, that there's just this, this stuff going on in the brain that's below the, the level of what we detect on MRI. There's a lot of research going on into what, how, what part of our immune system drives that, looking at things like microglial cells or what we call B cell follicles, little follicles of, of inflammation driven by B cells in the brain itself. The other thing that we think drives some of that, that progression when there's no relapse and no MRI activity is loss of neural reserve, just our brain's ability to adapt to an injury and we lose that ability as we get older. So I, I would say stay tuned. It's an area of a lot of research, and, and hopefully we're going to have you know, more things to, to offer for that in the future. Thank you. Uh, Tanya asks, when you quit to Sabri, what's next in the PO form? I'm assuming by oral form. Yeah, so it really de depends upon what the person has used, what why the person is stopping Tysabri. So if someone's on Tysabri, let's say they're just getting older and their MS has been stable, stable for years, and maybe you're trying to well, go de-escalate or sort of maybe slowly get pe people off of a, de uh, a, a, a disease modifying therapy, you know, maybe in that person, you don't need to use something with a really high level of effectiveness. You know, maybe in that person, something like an, an Abagio or teraflunamide might be great. If you're if you have someone who's had very active, very aggressive MS, and for maybe safety reasons, you you can't continue their Tysabri, maybe their JC virus antibody index has crept up to a level that you're not comfortable with. Maybe you need you want to move that person to something that's going to be right up there in terms of effectiveness or maybe for that person a maven clad is going to be the better oral fit or a zaposia so it really is, is going to depend upon the individual's situations as to why they're going off tisabri thank you uh with that a question about age uh what age do you usually stop dmts my neurologist said it's around 60s yeah so so we've guessed at it for a long time. So, and I would say every healthcare provider out there had kind of their own, you know, some would say 60, some said 65. You know, there have been studies now that have looked at age 55 and up. And it, it you know, it, it also depends on what you're stopping. The It looks like it's probably a little bit easier to stop one of our older therapies, like a, a glutamer, an interferon therapy, than it is to stop maybe one of our more effective therapies, like a Tysabri, you know, Jelenia, Okavus type type drug. Um, there is no perfect age, and so you could say there is data out there for fifty five and up. We're we're starting to use some of the the serum biomarkers, some of the blood tests that are available now that might give us some guidance. These things, blood tests that might look for evidence of inflammation or evidence of ongoing uh, uh, axonal damage in the brain and spinal cord, and maybe those will help guide us. Ultimately, the people listening to this, the people living with MS, you, you're in the driver's seat. So, you know, as we have these discussions, we want you know you to understand it. A lot of this is going to be within your comfort levels. Yeah, you know, we have people who are very, very motivated to get off treatment for whatever reason. We have other people who say, nope, I like this security blanket and I will lose sleep if if I'm off of this. And there's no right or wrong in that. It's just individual risk tolerance. Thank you. Uh, Patty asks, when I eat, all my energy goes to digestion. Is there anything I can do to help? Uh, maybe, you know, so you do, uh, we use a lot of energy uh, you know, to, to sort of process food. And so that's energy that's not going to the central nervous system. And so it, some people do get more fatigued after they eat. You, you'd one or two are their blood sugar shifts. That So is it more than just an MS thing? Could it be, you know, shifts in blood sugar that are going along with that? So blood sugar goes up when you eat and then it can come back down in some, some people. Um, maybe smaller, more frequent meals so you're not taxing the system quite as much. You might experiment with different types of foods. You know, is, is it more of a carbohydrate thing? Is it more of a protein thing? And, and just kind of play with it a little bit and see if, if by, you know, smaller meals spread out and different types of foods, if, if maybe that helps minimize some of that, uh, what we call postprandial fatigue. Thank you. Uh, we have an anonymous question. 
If my ventricle slash GM width is increasing, is that a sign of brain atrophy? And does this mean my DMT isn't working? So in general, if, you know, if, if we have atrophy, if the, the tissue in our brain is shrinking, something has to take up that space. And the ventricles, the fluid-filled parts of the brain are, are the things that would typically get larger. So normally we think if the gray matter is getting smaller, the ventricles are getting larger, we do take that as a sign of atrophy. You do realize that there is normal atrophy for aging. So after about age 30, all of our brains start shrinking a little bit, kind of, kind of humbling. But so if, you know, if I look at a 60 year old person's brain versus a 12 year old person's brain they look different you know our brains do shrink a little bit but with ms there is you know atrophy that's above normal aging in in some people ideally with disease modifying therapy you know we talk about nida no evidence of disease activity that means no re, no relapse no progression of disability no new mri lesion some people use the term nida four and the four in that they would add no brain atrophy Ideally, we'd like to see no atrophy. If you are seeing some, it does, I think, make us step back and say, okay, are we doing as much as we can humanly do with our current disease-modifying therapies? And if, if maybe the person's not on a highly effective therapy, that might be a discussion to be had about moving to something more effective. Thank you. Uh, Alex asks, how effective can PT be? We love, I work at Shepherd Center. We're, we are a rehab hospital, for, first and foremost, so we're, I'm biased. We like our physical therapists and occupational therapists quite a bit. I think in a perfect world, I would have every person with MS touch faces with a physical therapist every year. Uh, we don't live in a perfect world, so we have to be a little more selective. Um, physical therapy, depending upon what you're, you're trying to do, if you know, they do a great job with helping with walking, with balance issues, with managing spasticity, putting people in a good stretching program. Um, one of the things I like for the physical therapist to do is to use that as a gateway into getting people into a regular exercise program. You know, let, let's get you tuned up as much as we can. Unfortunately, insurance is not gonna pay for physical therapy forever. Usually then we like to hand that person off then to you know, some sort of regular exercise program. Here at Shepherd, we we have a wellness program that we have exercise physiologists who kind of take over where the when the physical therapist steps out and help people maintain those goals and hopefully continue building. Thank you. Uh, Anitra asks, I was diagnosed in December 2023 and have been started on three times a week capaxone injections. I read and heard from some MS patients that this is the least effective DMT. What do you think? So the our copaxone is what we call one of our platform therapies. It is one of our older DMTs. So if if you look at our older DMTs, copaxone, our interferons like beta seron, Avonex, Rebif, those drugs in general are not as effective as some of the newer therapies like a Tysabri, an Ocrevus, a, a Maven clad, the, the S1P oral drugs. So the if you're just if you took a thousand people and you put 500 on one of the older drugs like Copaxone, 500 on one of the the more the newer drugs in general, those newer drugs are more effective. That said, can a drug like Copaxone, even though it is less effective in general, can it be enough for some people? Yes, I mean we have, have people who've been on Copaxone since the first day it came out, and they're doing great. They have, they're meeting all the the goals, and for that individual, maybe it was enough. But but yes, in general, it is not as effective as some of the, the, the newer uh, medications. Thank you. Uh, quickly asked, what are the indicators for CIS versus RRMS? So CIS or clinically isolated syndrome, by definition, you've only had one event. So you've had one bout of something, transverse myelitis, optic neuritis, something. Um, with to call it RR uh, relapse and remitting MS, the definition of that is dissemination of focal neurological events in time and space. It means you had more than one of something. In the old, old days, we would say you had to have two attacks. That was called the poser criteria. Now we use, there have been several modifications of the McDonald criteria. Now, to, to call it two attacks, we could say, well, maybe you had one event, but maybe you had a new MRI lesion uh, a month later. 
uh, or maybe your first MRI, we see both old and new lesions. So technically that's dissemination in time and space. So to call it RRMS, there has to be some indication that, that it's an ongoing uh, process spread out through your central nervous system. Makes sense. Thank yeah. you. Uh, anonymous question. Can someone have ataxia without having MS? Yeah, I mean, ataxia is a symptom. So it just means that you're you walk like you've had a drink too many. And there are a thousand things that could cause ataxia. And not all of it's going to be MS. I mean, lots and lots of different things uh, could do that. Some involving the central nervous system, even peripheral nervous system issues can, can cause ataxia. Thank you. Uh, Sharon has her hand raised, so I'm going to just try to unmute her. Sharon, can you hear us? I'll give it another few seconds. Sharon, can you hear us? If so, you are muted. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will feel free to raise your hand again and I'll call on you. Um, in the meantime, Peggy from Fort Myers says she was diagnosed with MS at age 20 in 1972, now she is 72 and having tremors. Her neurologist thinks that they're MS related, but another neurologist seems to know more about tremors and thinks that they are an essential tremor. Um, she has an appointment to look into deep brain stimulation. Is there any way she can find out what actually is causing these tremors? Yeah, so, so both MS and essential tremor can cause tremors. Typically with MS, the tremors that we see are, they're big, they're what we'll call intention tremors. So you try to reach out and grab something and the closer you get, the bigger the tremor gets. Um, typically tremors with MS are going to start early in the course of MS. To have MS for the length of time that she's been dealing with it and to just now you know, in her 70s develop tremors, statistically benign and central tremor would be more likely. Um, they do look a little bit different. I mean, if, if she's working with a kind of a movement disorders the specialist, like the tremor specialist, they, they're usually pretty good at, at looking at the different tremor types and, and saying whether it's benign, essential, or, uh, or MS-related tremor. Um, if she's being referred uh, for possible deep brain stimulation, I will say that the good news is deep brain stimulation can work for either. Um, it's it's certainly probably done more commonly for benign essential tremor, but we have people with MS who do have intention tremor from their MS. They've had deep brain stimulation and it worked well for them. Thank you. Um, Mary says, I've been reading about metformin repairing myelin building cells. What are your thoughts? And also, what would be the rationale on how metformin is affecting the cells? Yeah, so, so uh, there's a huge area of research looking at repurposing FDA-approved molecules, and metformin was one of those discoveries. Um, it's kind of the reverse way of doing research. So normally you say, I bet if I did this in the central nervous system, it would do X. It would stop relapses. It would repair myelin. And so you develop, design you know, a, a therapy based upon what you're trying to accomplish. In this sense, we're kind of doing it the back, the reverse way. They they discover that these molecules look like they repair myelin, and then we'll figure out the why later. So I don't know that we know for sure why uh, my metformin might repair. There's there are theories on it. Another example of, is a molecule called clemistine. It's an antihistamine. was was one of the, the molecules that was identified in this type of research uh, that might repair myelin. Um, so there are uh, studies going on, ongoing with metformin by itself to repair myelin. There is a study com uh, combining metformin and the clemistine. Uh, jury's still out. It's exciting stuff. I think it would be awesome if this works because you don't have to wait for FDA approval. It's already an FDA approved molecule. You know, we can have a, have a pretty good feel for what the safety is. It's been around forever and it's cheap. So yeah, well, I think it's exciting. Thank you. Uh, Sandy says, my daughter has all the symptoms of MS and CSF has high oligoclonal bands and IgG, but with MRI, uh, there's only one lesion in the right spot. So we're told she has clinically isolated syndrome. Can presence of these bands be used as a surrogate 
as one of the confirmatory factors, especially in the setting of severe symptoms so she can start treatment instead of waiting for more damage. So if, so if you only have one lesion on MRI, but you have oligoclonal bands and you've only had the one event, a clinically isolated syndrome, um, it, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to put that person in the relapsing emitting MS box yet, but you could say that person has very, very high risk. So the two things in a CIS patient that would predict a high risk of having future events would be a suspicious looking lesion on MRI. Even one suspicious looking lesion on MRI puts that person up into the, you know, almost the 90% range chance that that's his MS. If they have oligoclonal bands in their spinal fluid that you don't see in the blood, so they're unique to the spinal fluid, that is an independent risk factor. If you have both of those things, you have a suspicious looking lesion and you have oligoclonal bands, you're in a very, very high risk group. Uh, most you know, MS centers would entertain the thought of starting therapy in that person. If, if there is a person with very high risk, with the thought being, is there a price that we pay by waiting and you know, for something else to happen? Even most insurance companies are okay with starting you know, therapy in someone with a CIS with a very high risk for future events. Thank you. Uh, Deb from Facebook asks, is it okay to take CBD with Kasimta? So I don't see any direct contraindication. You know, CBD, it, it is metabolized, you know, like a medication, but in, gen in general, Kasimta does not have a high risk for drug-drug interactions. Uh, the risk with CBD is not high. I, I would not have any con concerns about someone doing those two things together. Thank you. Uh, Deborah asks, if you only have lesions in the brain, can that produce symptoms anywhere in the body? Yes. I mean, ultimately, everything in your body is under the control of, of the brain. You know, in general, when we think about you know, where MS lesions form, there's a general rule that you know, if someone has a lot of brain lesions and maybe not as many spinal cord lesions, usually you're going to see you know, more issues with cognition, mood, things like that, whereas spinal cord lesions are usually more associated with walking issues, you know, coordination issues. But that, that's a very rough, rough rule. Thank you. Uh, anonymous question. What are your thoughts on HSCT? Uh, so HSCT, you know, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, um, is probably one of the most effective things we could do as a disease-modifying therapy. You know, basically, you're shutting down the existing immune system and rebooting it with a fresh immune system. I, the, you, the, the key appears to be selecting the right type type of individual with MS. Now, the research is ongoing, but but right now you could say the ideal candidate for HSCT would be someone with a relapsing form of MS under the age of 50, and they've got very active disease, a lot of relapses, a lot of uh, active lesions on MRI. And what some people would add that maybe they failed a highly effective therapy right now. Um, this is my personal prediction. I, I do predict there will be a day when HSCT is a more commonly used therapy and probably used earlier in MS. Uh, there is you know, a lot of appeal to it. In theory, it's a one-time deal. You do this treatment once mm -hmm. and you should be good for the rest of your life. It's not something to take lightly. We do have to get rid of the existing immune system and that, that's with high-dose chemotherapy. So there is risk to, to doing that. Thank you. Uh, Karen asks, do you think that GLP-1 medications might be used to treat or cure MS, and are there any trials ongoing that you know of? I haven't seen any. I mean, we have, obviously have a lot of people with MS on these drugs um, for, for you know, uh, type 2 diabetes and weight loss and or both at the same time. Um, I haven't seen any trials at this time with the GLP-1 uh, or GLP uh, drug for, for MS, that doesn't mean it, it couldn't happen. I and mean, again, there's a lot of interest in repurposing uh, things right now. So I, I would say stay tuned. I, I don't know of anything right now though. Thank you. Anonymous question, is occipital nerve blockage a good treatment for MS pain? 
So occipital nerve block would be used very specifically for occipital neuralgia. So occipital, your greater occipital nerve comes out of the base of your skull, supplies sensation to that half of your head, and you can have nerve pain that travels along that nerve. Um, if you're dealing with that, occipital nerve blocks can, can be a wonderful treatment. It's easy, it's low risk. When it works, it generally works for you know months at a time uh, before you have to go back in and have it redone. Thank you. Uh, Joanne asks, your thoughts on hip flexor assist device. Does it help with weak hip flexors? So the two weakest muscles in a person's leg with MS are going to be the hip flexors and your ankle dorsiflexors, your ability to get your foot up off the ground. That's why foot drop is so common in MS. The, usually, if you've got foot drop, you've probably got weakness in the hip flexors also. Um, those devices, uh, I, I think, can be wonderful. Like any device, whether it's an ankle foot orthotic, a cane, a walker, you know, the, the, the hip flexor devices, I, ideally you would work with a physical therapist to try it out, to make sure you're using it appropriately and to make sure it does what you want it to do. Uh, and really to make sure also that you've got all the different treatment options laid out in, in front of you. Thank you. Uh, Deb from Facebook asked to follow up with your question about uh, metformin. If we would take a nerve medication to remyelinate, would we still have to stay on a DMT? Good My question. Will so, not the clomastine. Yeah. So, I, so if you think about the goals in MS, you know, one goal is to stop ongoing damage, and so that's where all of our disease modifying therapies right now fit into. You know, some do some of the current DMTs. You know, sometimes show improvement yes i don't think they're directly repairing anything i think they're they're some of the more effective therapies do such a good job at stopping the the inflammatory process that natural repair mechanisms might take over whereas when you think about a metformin a clomestine you know mesenchymal stem cells those are repair mechanisms in theory you would think you would have to do both and so you would think you would have to have something that stops the, the any more damage and then cleans up the mess that has been made. Now, those those lines are getting a little bit blurred. There are things in research right now that might cover both bases. Uh, there, we're doing a study with uh, it's a, it's vitoflutamus. It's a, a oral medication that we think might have repair potential, but it also is anti-inflammatory, antiviral. So there may be things in the pipeline that could, could wear both hats. Thank you. Uh, anonymous question. When do you know if it's time for a cane? I'm having issues with just all of a sudden falling to the side or leaning back and I grab whoever is near me if I'm not near a wall. Yeah, this would be the ideal situation to get a physical therapist involved. So let them look at what what is it that's messing up your walking? Is it one thing? Is it a couple of things? And what is the best way to adapt to that? It sounds like that's a, a good situation for cane. It always makes me a little bit nervous if someone just runs to Walgreens and buys a cane you know, off the counter. The, the canes, it seems like they'd be pretty simple, but you, you want to make sure that you've got the right length. That, you know, Do you need a single point cane? Do you need a cane with a bigger base? And really what's going to be the best for you? you know, sometimes people get the wrong piece of equipment and it actually puts them at higher risk for falling if we, if we don't do things correctly. Right. Uh, thank you. Debbie Hamlin asks, uh, can MS cause eyelids to twitch? I've been having reoccurring eyelid twitch for a while. First, it was the left. Now it's the right. And my ophthal um, ophthalmologist hate that word, uh, said everything's well during the eye exam. And my neurologist seems to dismiss the eyelid twitching. Yeah, so that that's a common MS symptom. It's, it, and the good news is, is there's nothing dangerous. It's an annoyance. It's called myokinia. It's the eyelid flutter. It, to the person experiencing it, it feels like there's an earthquake. If someone is looking at that person, they'd have to be like inches from their face to see it. But it, because it's such a sensitive muscle, it's really annoying for people. The good news is it will not affect your vision. It's not the optic nerve. It will not give you double vision. It just gives you an annoying twitchy eyelid. Um, usually it'll go run a course for you know a while. It'll stop and then it'll pop over on the other side. Some people feel if they're stressed, it'll do it a little bit more. So if they're sleep deprived, if they you know, load up a lot on caffeine, sometimes that'll drive it. Um, there are medications that we can use. 
in general, probably the med the side effect risk of the medicine is worse than the symptom for, for most people. Thank you. Uh, Laura asks, are there any new therapies for PPMS in development? So there are, you know, I think progressive MS, primary progressive and secondary progressive MS really is still one of the great unmet needs in, in MS. Um, yes, there are things in development. Uh, that the me medicine I mentioned early, earlier, the, the Vitafludimus is one of those drugs that's being tested in progressive forms of MS. There is this other class of drugs uh, called BTK inhibitors, uh, Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Most of those are being tested in progressive forms of MS. So, so yes, there, there's stuff uh, in the pipeline out there. Thank you. Lisa asks, have you seen any positive research with lipid replacement therapy in MS? I have not. I mean, there's, you know, the idea, so myelin is is mostly fat. And so, you know, 90 plus percent of myelin is is fat. There was interest years ago, there was a movie, uh, Lorenzo's Oil, that came out about a child with adrenal leukodystrophy. And the dad discovered this, uh, especially you know, this diet where you were really loading up on certain, you know, uh, um, uh, fatty acids to try to replace and repair myelin. That the problem in MS is your your myelin is perfectly fine. We just need your immune system to stop damaging it, or we need to make it better. You don't make bad myelin. It's just that it, we need, it, it's being attacked. It's very different from kids with the leukodystrophies where they, they make bad myelin. It falls apart on its own. So I haven't seen anything you know, in MS in terms of the, the lipid replacement. If some When we talk about lipids, sometimes people... We, start thinking about things like cholesterol and triglycerides that there is some evidence that you know that there is a rough correlation between ms and bad cholesterol uh, that your your uh, ldls um there's research looking at statin drugs as ms treatments we don't think those statin drugs work as disease modifying therapies necessarily by what they do to lipids we think it may be more anti-inflammatory effects that they have Thank you. Uh, Teresa asks, could monthly IVIG infusions benefit someone with progressive MS? So there is data for, for IVIG out there. I would say it's a little bit stronger in relapsing forms of MS than, than in progressive forms of, uh, of MS. Um, you know, the, the challenge with progressive MS is it looks like the inflammatory component is not as as present as it is in relapsing forms of MS. And ultimately, so many of our therapies are anti-inflammatory. So if that target's not there, it makes it a little bit, bit tougher. One of the biggest challenges we have with IVIG is because it's off-label for any form of MS, and it's probably one of the most expensive things we can do. We, we do run into a lot of resistance from insurance companies. They they are very unhappy with us when we, when we try to use that. <laughs> Uh, Kim asks from Facebook, is there anything out there for chronic fatigue and MS? She has uh, progressive MS. Yeah. So there are lots of fatigue treatments. And, and so you know, we could spend an hour talking just about fatigue. One of the first rules, we want to make sure that it really is MS fatigue, that you don't have another health issue, another metabolic problem, thyroid problems, disrupted sleep. So treat those and rule those out as much as we can. If it really looks like it is primary MS fatigue, we tend to look at things like modafinil or armodafinil, provigil, uh, new vigil, the true stimulant drugs, your Ritalin, Adderall type medications, amantadine or Symmetril is an old anti-influenza drug that gives an energy boost to some people with MS. And then there's some supplements that have been have shown uh, some promise, uh, acetylcholine, uh, um, yeah, acetylcarnitine, excuse me. Um, uh, has been studied and showed that in some people to give a nice little energy boost. And then there was a study last year looking at oral lavender, uh, in the ground up lavender flower in a capsule. Uh, and it was a double blind placebo controlled trial, small, but it was positive. Um, and that's cheap and easy. You can order oral lavender uh, on Amazon. They did a 600 milligram dose in the lavender study. Um, I've had a hard time finding that. I, what I found was a 500 milligram uh, and some of our patients have said it it did help, just one capsule in the morning. That's really interesting. Because you think of lavender, something you take at bedtime for your calming right. sleep, but and I'm not sure what possessed them to try it as a morning dose, but it, it did seem to help in some folks. 
Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Anitra asks, why is there an age to stop DMTs? Does it cause damage in the body? Yeah, good, good question also. So it's because the human immune system calms down as we get older. So maybe the need for the DMT becomes less. So that process is called immune senescence. It's a natural calming of the immune system as we get older. You know, MS is driven by a relatively overactive immune system attacking something that it shouldn't be attacking. So if that overactive immune system tends to calm a little bit as we get older, maybe there's a point at which you, you don't need to be on the, the DMT anymore. Thank you. Uh, Quigley asks, I was diagnosed at 57 last August with one cervical lesion and no brain lesions. Is the DMT end date based on the starting age? No. So it's really more based upon the so the 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 current age. And again, a lot of variability, but again, you know, based upon current research, we would at least start entertaining that discussion about coming off a of DMT maybe age 55 to 60, but highly variable. Uh, from person to person. Thank you. Uh, Lisa says, thank you for this time. Can you please speak to MS caused by environmental issues? I grew up in an area where radioactive material was leaked into our ground and water. Area has clusters of autoimmune illnesses and cancers, and all my siblings have issues. Three have MS. So we, we know MS has a genetic component, but it's not strongly hereditary. So there's the genetic component and the environmental component. A lot of the environmental research is, is right now is focusing on Epstein-Barr virus as a potential trigger in someone who has the right genetics. But there, that's not the only pathway. There are probably other pathways to having MS. And I think you know, this concept of like super antigens or you know exposures to toxins, uh, heavy metals, you know, radiation. Uh, when I was in Spokane, Washington, just you know, uh, south of there, there's the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, where that's a big, super fun cleanup site from leakage, and that was one of the hotbeds for for autoimmune thyroid disease. So, so there there is probably something there uh, of these these environmental toxins maybe serving as a trigger. There was a spike in autoimmune conditions after the first uh, desert storm, you know, when uh, the, all those oil fields were blazing in Kuwait and you know, spewing all of that that toxin into the, the into the air. A lot of those soldiers who came back, there was a, a higher risk of autoimmune conditions there. I think the hard thing is, what do we do with that information? I mean, you know, I think it's very interesting epidemiologically, and maybe it gives us something to, to try to prevent in the future. What do you do for someone like her who now it's, it's kind of after the fact? I don't know that it changes the, the, the treatment for right now. Thank you. Um, Angela says, why am I getting worse even though I've been on DMT since 1998? So so again, the you know, the goal with the DMT is that that acronym NEDA, N-E-D-A. Um, if someone is is having relapses, new lesions and MRI are progressing in spite of being on a, a DMT, then we, we do want to look at that DMT and say, okay, is it time for a change? Can we do better? You know, unfortunately, we do see people who are on the best stuff we've got right now, you know, like a B cell therapy or an natalizumab, and they're still experiencing that pure of progression independent of relapse activity. I don't know that we have the answer to that yet. You know, again, there's hope things on the horizon like the btk inhibitors there's a therapy out there called car t uh, uh it's a way of modifying t cells in a laboratory the person's own t cells and hopefully going after some of this very low level inflammation uh to to stop this kind of situation well thank you uh deborah asks have you had any female patients that have their pelvic floor affected Absolutely. And there are physical therapists that that is their whole area of specialization. So pelvic floor therapy is something we refer folks out to commonly. So weakness in you know, the, the pelvic floor is muscle and it can be weak and in some of even spastic and be to, to have, have uh, too much tone just like any other muscle in the body. And so that can affect bowel and bladder function, sexual function. So uh, you know, when, when that's an issue, we do refer both men and women uh, out to pelvic floor physical therapists. Thank you. Uh, Karen has a two-part question. 
Is heavy arm syndrome related to MS? And what about electric shock feelings in the back of my head and down my spine? So the electric shocks for sure. So if you, if you can reproduce it with neck flexion, that's the thing called Lermite's sign. Mm -hmm. uh, so and that usually goes along with, with old demyelination in your cervical spine. If it's going up the back of the head, that's usually the, the great occipital nerve, the same nerve that causes the occipital neuralgia. We sometimes think of those, uh, those head electrical shocks as maybe a variation of, of occipital neuralgia. Um, the good news is neither of those, is, you're not causing new damage. If you do flex your neck and you get that funny electrical feeling, you're not hurting anything. Um, the heavy arms, it, the, you know, if, if you're, if you hold your arms out and they fatigue and they're just dropping, the, and that can be a form of nerve fiber fatigue with multiple sclerosis. So any muscle that you, you use in a sustained fashion can get weak the longer you try to use it. There is an interesting phenomenon. It's a kind of a little variation on Lermite's signs. With Lermite's, we normally think of the electric buzzing when you flex your neck. Um, there's an older sign, and they, they really don't teach it in medical school enough. So if someone's holding their arms out and they flex their neck and their arms get weaker and drop, that can also be a, a sign of that, you know, that old demyelination in your cervical spine. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Um, anonymous. Currently, I have 20 plus brain lesions in my brain and a black hole in my corpus callosum, nothing in my spine. I'm off DMTs at 56, cognitively worse, several falls resulting in fractures and stitches, no flare-ups lately, but seems like my symptoms aren't ceasing and getting worse. Should I start back in a DMT? Past, I've tried Capaxone, Casenta, and Abagio. I would certainly talk to your team. Uh, this is that sort of situation where, you know, the, the no relapse, not necessarily new lesions, but just the progression. I would certainly talk to your team about the pros and cons of starting, restarting something. Um, also, maybe see if there are any clinical trials that are going on that might be a good fit for you uh, since you're not on anything uh, right now. Um, Two of the things you described would be something we would definitely want to get therapists involved with. So, so with the cognitive issues, we like getting speech language pathology involved to do cognitive rehabilitation, kind of physical therapy for your cognition, um, and also think about physical therapy for fall prevention. You know, the, the, we don't want the neurological issue of MS to become an orthopedic issue due to the falls and, and someone breaking something, and because that certainly doesn't help going forward with with your walking. And then, even because it be a psychological factor, and people get afraid of walking and, uh, mm -hmm. because of the of the fall risk. So, yeah, I would definitely think about physical therapy and work with a speech language pathologist for your cognition. Thank you, uh, Chantal. Asked, are MS folks more prone to get Alzheimer's? No. So, so it, it, cognitive issues are common with MS. 65% you know, or so of people with MS have some cognitive changes, but it's not a dementia. You know, typically, what we see with MS is, is word finding difficulties, slow processing speed. We don't want to minimize it. It, it. it can affect people's quality of life. It can affect how well you're able to work, but it's not Alzheimer's uh, disease. Alzheimer's would be completely independent. Thank you. Uh, Francis asked, how effective is Casimta? So Casimta, you know, is one of our B cell therapies and it, it's certainly up there in the food chain. I would argue right now, probably at the top of our food chain with DMTs would be the B cell therapy. So Casimta, Briumbi, Ocrevus, Rituxan, um, Natalizumab, and then I would put Mavenclad up there amongst the, the, the highly effective therapies. Thank you. A um, few more questions. I know we're nearing the end. Uh, Angela asks, can you explain myelitis? So, so in, in medicine, if you put the itis on the end of it, it means it's inflamed. Myelo means spinal cord. So inflammation in your spinal cord. So a lot of times we'll put the word transverse in front of that. So transverse myelitis, it means it's, it's kind of a section of your spinal cord that was inflamed. Um, you can see transverse myelitis with multiple sclerosis, but there are other conditions that can cause it also. So, so I always tell the medical students we work with, transverse myelitis is not really a diagnosis, it's a description. You have inflammation in your spinal cord. Your next question should be, from what? Is it multiple sclerosis? Is it lupus? Is it neuromyelitis optica? You know, th there are a lot of things that can cause uh, myelitis. 
Thank you. Um, Patty asks, I'm four years off Aquavis. My B cells have not returned. Why? So the you know the on average, once you stop a B cell therapy like Ocovis, those B cells will start repopulating in about six months. Um, they may not return to normal for quite a while. I would say if you're four years out and they're not significantly better, I might bounce that off of a hematologist just to make sure there's not any other thing going on. Are you on another medication that's kind of slowing that recovery? Because that, that is a long time for, for the B cells to, to come back. Thank you. And then we have a question from Anonymous. My husband was diagnosed with MS and was on Casimta since 2020. He's now diagnosed with progressive MS and is switching over to Ocrevus. Should there be anything we need to look out for that may be alarming when we transition? Not really. I mean, they're, they're very similar medications. I mean, they're, they're both what we call anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies. They work on B cells in the immune system. Um, the lab monitoring really is the same with the two. You with the Ocrevus, you, you there there might be a little higher potential for infusion reactions, but it's going to be the risk is going to be very low. If you're coming from Casemta to Ocrevus, you could say, well, my B cells are probably already low, so it's not like you're starting from scratch. And a lot of the initial infusion reactions we see with Ocrevus, we think, is when we give that first dose and your B cells have never seen that drug before. So, so usually that transition from Casemta to Ocrevus is, is fairly smooth. Thank you. Um, next question. What is your, I think you did answer this, but um, I've seen this a little bit now. What is your opinion on stem cell therapy for MS? So again, stem cells, you want to uh, sort of step back and say, what type of stem cells are you talking about? Is it HSCT, hematopoietic stem cell transplant? So that's the, let's get rid of your immune system and give you a new one with your own immature stem cells. So that's, that, that's the one that involves chemotherapy to get rid of your existing immune system. And then there's mesenchymal stem cell therapy, which you don't do anything to the person's immune system. You just give them the stem cells to try to repair damage. And there's, again, tons of research in both both arenas. A lot, I would say there's still a lot of questions with mesenchymal stem cells for repair. You know, where do we get them from? How do we give them? Should they be intravenous? Should they be put into the spinal fluid? There was an Italian group earlier this year that was very aggressive. They put the cells actually into the ventricles, into the spinal fluid, filled part of the, the, the deep brain, uh, and you put them there surgically. Uh, so that, I don't know that we have the final answer with mesenchymal stem cells on how effective are they and, and where, where do we put them. Thank you. Um, I have two more questions from Facebook. Uh, Pam asks, I just found out that I have breast cancer. Should I stay on Casenta? I've been on it for one and a half years. I, I would talk to both your neurology team and your oncology team. Some of that decision depends upon what they're going to do with your breast cancer. So if the person, in my book, if the person is going to have any sort of chemotherapy for their, their cancer, I would stop their disease modifying therapy like in all likelihood, um, just to give them a break. And because if you're on, on a chemotherapy, that is immunosuppressant. We can treat MS with a chemotherapy. It's not our favorite way to do it, but we can let that chemotherapy serve as the, the MS treatment you know, for the duration. If the person is not having chemotherapy, if it's going to be maybe surgery and radiation, then th then they may decide to, to continue the casempta throughout the, the breast cancer treatment. Thank you. Uh, Dina from Facebook asks, are there any recent updates on cognitive issues related to MS? It seems as though most of the research and studies emphasizes on mobility. Oh, no, I would say there's a lot of research on, on cognition and MS. Um, the reason I mean, there's a lot of research is it, it really affects people's quality of life. It is one of the most common reasons that people leave the workforce in MS. So that's one of the reasons we're interested in it. It's common. I mean, it's, it's present again in about 65% of people with MS. Um, it is an end point in a lot of clinical trials. I would say one of the challenges of making it a bigger part of research is it's, it's not quite as easy to study as say walking. You know, if I'm looking at your walking, I can do a time 25 foot walk in less than 10 seconds. If I'm looking at your cognition, it's a little more detailed than that. You know, we we do in we do recommend that people with MS if possible get some sort of 
cognitive screen on a yearly basis. Uh, we were a part of an international task force uh, a few years ago that and what the, the film was, was that probably the best easy cognitive screen was something called SDMT, symbol digit modality test. It takes literally just less than five minutes to do it. And it, it kind of gives you a snapshot of where someone's cognition is at uh, and, and can help us monitor for whether it's changing over time. Thank you. Um, well, that is all the time we have today. Um, and before we get to the end, I want to thank you, Dr. Thrower, for taking time out of your busy day to help educate all of us. If you missed any part of the conference, it's been recorded and is available through the MS Fo uh, Focus Facebook page and on our YouTube channel in a week or so. You can reply to the registration email to learn how to access the recording and for all our upcoming events. With that said, our next teleconference will be next Wednesday, April 17th at 6.30 p.m. with Dr. Aaron Foster. So if you have questions today that were unanswered, please bring them to our next conference and Dr. Foster will also be able to help answer those for you. As you leave the conference today, there will be a survey that uh, pops up in your email shortly after we end. And if you would please uh, just go ahead and fill it out. It allows us to see what type of topics you'd be interested in so we can provide you with the most meaningful programs. Thank you to our attendees for your participation in all these questions, and especially to Dr. Thrower. Thank you so much for this evening, and I hope you have a great day.